Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Priya Patek, who is away this week, I'm uh, going to start uh, our uh, Grand Rounds uh, exercise today uh, and uh, introduce uh, the topics, our panelists. But before we uh, do that, um, we would like to do our uh, traditional poll at the beginning so we get a sense of uh, the composition of uh, the audience. Travis? Wow, this is like a horse race here. It looks like the, uh, uh, come on, APPs, you can, you can do it. Oh, others up there too. All right, thank you. So hopefully uh, uh, we'll uh, have um, a very multidisciplinary topic uh, for uh, all of you uh, that um, you know, will be worth your time. Uh, initially, uh, we're going to uh, first uh, deal with the reality of life. Uh, uh, informatics and uh, our medical director of health informatics, Dr. Karen Oleg, is going to give an update. And uh, I do just want to add that uh, he's extremely accessible uh, um, when you do have issues, and he's been a great resource for all of us. And then we're going to have our uh, traditional end of the month uh, morbidity, uh, our MM conference. And our resident, Dr. Ankita Kapoor, is going to present a case of uh, severe thrombocytopenia and uh, thrombosis. And uh, I will then uh, follow up. And then uh, is a added uh, feature, which is great. Uh, the actual patient uh, is uh, joining us and we'll be able to take questions and uh, we'll share her perspective, which I think is just great that we're able to do that. And I thank her in advance. So with uh, no further uh, ado, I'd like to uh, again introduce Dr. Alec, who again is our uh, Medical Director of Health Informatics. Uh, Karen? Thank you, Peter. Uh, can you confirm if you're able to see my slides? Yep. Anyway. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm presenting our quarterly updates. Uh, every three months, we bring up uh, what's changed and what's going to be changing. Uh, one of the highlights is that we are scheduled for a quarterly update uh, next week on 4th of February. So I'll uh, bring some screenshots and good features we're going to be adding on next week. Uh, so briefly, uh, introducing you to our health informatics uh, teams and committees. There is a multidisciplinary order set committee led by Dr. Nasser, uh, which um, does work and have the responsibility of uh, monitoring and uh, managing the safety and accuracy um, regulatory requirements of the order sets to make sure they are compliant. In addition, adding uh, uh, efficiencies as much as possible to make sure uh, they are evidence-based and driven that way. Uh, they have been uh, active and instrumental in reviewing almost more than 100 order sets, uh, continue to do it. Uh, their important ongoing work has been uh, du uh, avoiding the duplicate PRN pain medications for similar intensity analgesia. Uh, in addition, stroke order set standardization, uh, they have been working with the discharge order sets to make the discharge process seamless and uh, uh, not um, bringing everything to the provider to avoid any misses. And in addition, uh, always preparing for downtime order sets uh, in case of a downtime, so we always preserve our clinical practice. So that's our person to reach out uh, for order sets. If there's something you would want to retire or update, uh, that's the committee. This is the other uh, team I would like to introduce again uh, is the specialist, uh, trained specialist uh, led by Greg Denisenko. There are currently 17 STS trainers. Uh, we are your colleagues, uh, work in the same specialty lines, service lines, and you can always request a session, could be a group session, could be a one-to-one -one session, uh, it would be remote these days for sure, uh, but uh, something to add efficiencies in your daily practice. Uh, if you're leaders for your group, you can always uh, organize small group sessions, uh, one to as many as you feel like. And uh, aim is not on uh, the workflow because that would be uh, more uh, on the teams and the groups you're working with, but uh, efficiencies of EMR on how to make it efficient, where to find things, and save time and in addition uh, to realize the full potential of the software we have in, in place. Uh, how to reach out, uh, there's an email address, SDS support at Rochester Regional. If you email them out, uh, he usually gets back to you very soon and uh, we can organize a session. 
Uh, third one is the 21st Century CARES Act about the info blocking uh, as updates are coming out, rolling out in phases. Uh, just a reminder that on the portal page, as uh, things are moving through, um, information will be updated there and more to bring up. Uh, Dr. Cabral is the one uh, leading that project. Uh, this is uh, something uh, we wanted to bring out was the My Care activation and ach achievements. Uh, we have been focusing on engaging our patients not only into uh, their own care, but also towards education. So it's a reliable source of uh, getting education about condition, diagnosis, health maintenance, and prevention. Uh, so our patient engagement has continued to go up. Uh, I think partly because of the pandemic, uh, also my care video visits, uh, but something uh, which we should all work towards. Uh, the next slide shows you how easy is it to sign up a patient. Uh, on the patient chart on the storyboard, you will see a sign that if they're signed up or not, uh, it, it's a little computer icon with a slash there. And if somebody is signed up, there'll be a green check. If uh, a, a patient you're taking care of is requesting records, it would be a good chance to uh, actually engage them into not only the uh, record they need, but into an entire sign up to the system so they can get anything as they need to. If you click on, it sends them a text message or an email. They answer a few security questions and they're online and they can access the records. Uh, Care Connect upgrades uh, on the portal page again, there are things about the upgrade, all the new things happening. It's divided by your role. So that way you're able to digest uh, quickly, see what are changes going on for my particular role. Uh, it is next Thursday. Um, the link is if you click Care Connect on the portal, upgrade and updates, and that divides into role-based uh, changes. Now coming to upgrades, what are the things changing next uh, week? I think I'll start with some screenshots. Currently, patients who are admitted, uh, when you're ordering medications for them, uh, there is a place in managed orders where you order meds for hospital, but there's a different uh, convoluted process to go into a discharge navigator to order meds for discharge, which it's a lot of clicks away. Now there's going to be a tab there which says future outpatient orders, and you can put discharge medications right there as and when you see could be a uh, follow-up appointment, could be orders for discharge. And when you do that, at the time of actual discharge, when you're reconciling meds, it would show up in the bottom. So this way it's less clicks and less hurdles away. Another update is for our ambulatory partners, uh, social determinants of health. If you click on the little chart, it brings a flow sheet row to answer on. And from there, you can see uh, what are the social determinants of health, which we can work with the care managers to act on. And it's uh, coming up in an easy uh, to see view. Uh, another change which has been long uh, requested and finally we are able to get it through Epic is the insulin instructions. It's available both for outpatient and inpatient. Outpatient in the med and orders, it's on the top. And inpatient on the discharge navigator, there'll be something called insulin instructions. What that allows is rather than having free text instructions, it could be uh, detailed as in adding mealtime instructions with uh, carb ratio, sensitivity, and how much to uh, change, and also linking a medication, which one to act on that area. The other options are fixed dosing interventions, like what to do in morning, afternoon, and dinner. Also pump settings if uh, somebody's on an insulin pump. Uh, the clean thing is when the patient gets it on the AVS, it is very clean. It tells them like a table, uh, like a chart, what to do. And as you make changes, it's easy to follow through. Uh, similarly for the pump, a person gets all the details of the pump, uh, gives, it, gives the patient a quick basal rate as well. And the sensitivity and changes could also be in half unit increments. Uh, smart phrases and smart lists. Now, if um, uh, for our providers who do document smart phrases, which are the dot phrases, you can combine all the dot phrases into a user smart list. And that way have all your node templates in one place rather than having to find them. As you start your note, your note is loaded up and you choose the option and go from there. This is something we can set up at the SDS session as well. Uh, for patient safety, allergy information has started to go out in the outgoing medication orders to retail pharmacies. So that way it keeps uh, pharmacies records up to date as well. Uh, in addition, when pharmacy uh, does send a prescription request to our ambulatory partners, uh, it does uh, also send alternatives uh, suggested by the pharmacy. So on the prescription request itself, you'll see what the alternatives are uh, based on patient coverage. And that way it makes it easier to select. 
uh, editing and attesting notes from the inbox set. There is a quick floating window now. It's a little cleaner layout uh, where you can attest note right in the window, or you can click a, a button and get into the encounter and get information from there. Inpatient treatment teams has a, a different layout. It's um, it's same information, just a cleaner way uh, for treatment teams, which do have team pagers. You can put the pagers there. It does identify the member same way. There is a way to search a team member by name if you have, and the past members are also available. So no change, more a layout different. Uh, secure chat in hyperspace. If there are certain favorite providers you're always communicating with, you can start them so it saves time bringing them as recent contacts. Uh, similar orders, if you're using your mobile devices like Haiku on the phone or Canto on tablet, that's a place where uh, if you're ordering anything which is similar, it would give a mark. And if you click on, it would show what all uh, was a duplicate there or similar. Uh, this is gonna be a MyCare enhancement for patients. They can see their COVID-19 status, which is um, at times required about the test results. So patients can see their uh, testing result and history right on the on their my care. For inpatient hospitalists, this is a trial on uh, sending updates to friends and family, and uh, hopefully this would work out and we can broaden it out further. On the patient list, there would be something called visit contacts on the top right. If you click on, you can add a recipient for that encounter, uh, checking with the patient. It does populate lists from demographics of my care history. But from there, you can um, update it as needed. And then you can send a quick email or a text to the family member so they're up to date, uh, especially with visitor restrictions. Uh, this thing, uh, it is not a HIPAA compliant message, so message should not be containing specific information. Uh, another thing on this is already live for patient list, you can add something called bed phone number. So if you're looking at the patients, you, um, if you have a list of patients working with, uh, you can add their phone numbers for the room. So it does help with PPE conservation or there are times that you have to reach out and you may not be on site. You can quickly reach the patients with the phone numbers on the bed. Uh, to add them on properties, search for bed and add the bed phone number. Uh, discharge order sets, the current discharge, uh, I was mentioning about the order set process. In the discharge order set, there is a uh, current discharge process needs follow-up appointments, properness reconciliation, discharge instruction, med rec and summary. Uh, what that does with the discharge order set is you can combine all the discharge instructions, follow-up appointments, and some prescribed medication panels or supplies, for example, dressing changes or pick line care. They could all be in a panel and it makes the process seamless. So it adds up only two steps. You do MedRec, which already has problem with reconciliation, and then the summary and you're done with the process. So cutting down lots of steps there. Uh, PR and analgesic cider, this is the one I was talking about that uh, similar intensity pain medication can only have one medication. There are order panels, um, uh, hundreds of order panels and order sets being updated right now. Uh, the indications are the ones which are changing to discrete field. Uh, the choices are gonna become single select for same indication. Uh, if there is duplication, it would ask you for a validation and remind you about error. Uh, and then there are approved analgesic panels where same medication is ordered by different routes expected to go live on February 22nd, and uh, there will be education coming out for us. Another thing to bring out is a deterioration index. This is our third predictive uh, analytics model, which complements the early detection of sepsis. What this does is it uh, monitors adult patients and calculates a score every 20 minutes to determine the risk of deterioration uh, based on their labs, vital signs, um, their uh, nursing assessment. Uh, it's a clear view, shows contributing factors. There's a multidisciplinary project team working on implementing it uh, and more education and information will be coming out next, uh, next month. Uh, what it did was it did give a little early warning sign towards uh, somebody who may deteriorate at a chance of deterioration and you can intervene early or try to find out. It is a predictive model, so not specific, but it does help identify those patients earlier. Uh, note security update, uh, shared, uh, this is uh, going to be coming up in a few weeks or so. Uh, what this does is uh, the end education will be coming out with it. Uh, shared note functionality where providers can share their notes with each other, like a discharge summary ongoing through the encounter. Uh, differences between a cosine versus a test note. What it does change is that ability to edit and take over somebody's note when a cosine was not requested or it was not shared. 
So erroneous uh, editing or taking over somebody else's other, another provider's note will be limited with this. Uh, attending or consulting physician will be able to attest or co-sign note even if it was not requested. So that way the authorship is maintained between the original note writer and the attestation goes separate. Uh, I think I'm almost 15 minutes in time, so uh, I can take a question or maybe I can, uh, you can reach out to me at the end of the session or email me or call me anytime and we can take questions after that. Thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, that's a very helpful uh, update. Uh, we do have a question about uh, primary doctors um, who've not been able to access CareConnect for the last several years. Um, and since the duo sign-up came, they can't see the consult notes. They cannot review x-rays several attempts to get it going. I have to get Department of Medicine to approve me, then someone from IT has to help me. Never has been fulfilled. It has been a frustrating feature. Okay, uh, can you reach out to me and that way we can follow this online, offline? I think it may be a user security reason. If there is a, a long duration of uh, inactive use, it does want you to verify security to make sure patient information is safe. Uh, that could be one of the reasons there, but I think they were, I heard three different issues there. So right. I can't can look... see the console notes. She can't review the x-rays. Okay, I can follow up with you. It may be related to care, uh, the care link possibly. So uh, my email is karan.alag and I can send it on the chat window. So please uh, reach out and then we'll fix this out. Great, and then um, I did have a question you mentioned in passing about Haiku. Um, and uh, can you just give us a quick update about expanding its functionality? Uh, more functionality is coming up, including uh, currently we can already write orders from it. Secure chat is available. Um, between Haiku, there would be a possibility of writing notes soon. We have gone with a Dragon, um, Dragon update, which uh, as it rolls out, would be able to even do note dictation from Haiku itself. So in the build phases, hopefully coming up in the next few months, uh, what they would also be able to do is something like, hey Siri, you may be able to ask, hey Epic to find information. So time saving as well as the, using the power of the mobile devices. So uh, thank you. Exciting stuff. Uh, can you clarify, you mentioned about the orders um, uh, on uh, your mobile device uh, and Haiku, for example, you can do now inpatient orders? Yes, you can do inpatient orders, or if you are in the right encounter, you can do orders. There are some orders which need uh, answering details about indication and charts. Those are the ones that would tell you, Haiku, that you have to do it in hyperspace. But uh, any other orders, you can definitely look at current orders, and you can discontinue or modify them easily. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you again for the update. And again, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Oleg, uh, whether you run into him in the hallways or elsewhere, he's always very accessible and uh, very committed and uh, for myself has been a great resource. So uh, thank you again, Karen. Thank you, Peter. And, um, we're now going to switch gears to our uh, traditional monthly M&M conference. And uh, hopefully you don't have to wait uh, till my part to know what Occam's uh, razor is, but uh, we're basically going to present a uh, case of uh, severe thrombocytopenia and extensive thrombosis uh, in a certain clinical setting. And our uh, second year resident, Dr. Ankita Kapoor, is uh, going to start. Ankita? Thank you, Dr. Quidis. Um, so let's see if all of us can say the same thing at the end of the case that is this, this, is this a case of Occam's razor? So I'm Ankita Kapoor, a second year me internal medicine resident, and presenting my grand round for Dr. Quidis. Um, so we had a 47 year old Caucasian female who presented to ER with diffuse skin rash fever and acute severe low back pain. Her diffuse skin rash was an erythematous maculopapular rash with few vesicles, which started six days before her presentation. It started on back and then spread to her arms, chest, abdomen, and progressed to bilateral arms and legs. It spared palms and soles, and there were no oral lesions. They were extremely itchy. Uh, she received methylprednisone from P2P a week ago, uh, which did not have any effect. On one day before presentation, she had a fever spike of 102 Fahrenheit. And one day before, she developed acute severe low back pain, which radiated to her anterior thighs. She went hiking three weeks ago in Scottsville. Uh, there were no known sick contacts, no new body products used. She was, she's up to date with medic, uh, immunization, and she had chicken pox as a child. Her past medical history was relevant for seasonal allergies, alopecia erota, 
uh, positive PPD for which she received treatment with isoniazid in 2000 and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. She, her family history was significant for her mother and sister had thyroid disease and mother had pulmonary embolism in the past. Brother has uh, rheumatoid arthritis and first degree cousin had SLE. Social history, she works as a social worker in an elementary school district, occasionally drinks wine, uh, quit, quit smoking in her teens, has a dog at home which was healthy, uh, lives with her husband and son. There were no known allergies and only medication she was taking was levothyroxine. Uh, pertinent positives on the physical exam were like on in ER, she was tachycardic. Uh, she was febrile with a temp of 103.6 Fahrenheit, tachypnic, and uh, her saturation was 92% on room air. Other pers pertinent positives were like there was shorty lymphadenopathy in cervical, axillary, and inguinal uh, regions. And then going on to her skin rash, uh, she had this diffuse erythematous macular papular rash with few recycles and like some crusting somewhere in her bilateral upper and lower extremities involving abdomen, uh, chest and the back. And as I mentioned, palms and soles were spared and uh, there wasn't much oral lesion. Uh, on her labs, her baseline, uh, her WBC was stable, hemoglobin was stable on day one. Platelet count had dropped like from 50% from a baseline of 240, they had dropped to 133. Her electrolytes were stable, kidney function was fine, and uh, there was no change in her liver enzymes as well. Uh, if we look at the platelet count, they were already 50% down on the day of admission, and on day two, they dropped to 50% uh, further down at 70K, and on day three, they were critically low at 21,000. Uh, so like for all the patients, you know, that we think about rheumatological workups, so that the same thing was done, but everything like uh, was negative, her C3, C4, uh, were with the normal limit. The only thing which was elevated was CRP at 251. A skin biopsy was done. Uh, so we tried to take the vesicle and a skin biopsy was done for that. And over here, you can see that there was some edema, uh, some neutrophilic uh, infiltration, but we didn't come to a conclusion from the skin biopsy. They, they also did the immunostaining for thinking about, could this be varicella zoster or some other infection? But since there wasn't any recycle which they could find, so th there was no immunostaining which was positive for anything at this point. Then uh, a micro other cultures were done which were negative. Then another recycle was sent by Dr. Falsi, especially for DFA, direct fluorescence, and that was positive for varicella zoster. And that is when we know, okay, so this is varicella zoster and everything else was negative. Now, looking at her hospital course, uh, so on the day one uh, from beginning, there was concern for viral exam term. She was started on oral acyclovir. where dermatology and ID were consulted and they helped with the diagnosis. Uh, then on day two, uh, she was having the severe back pain and there was concern for probably myelitis from viral infection. That's why oral acyclovir was changed to IV and neurology was consulted. Uh, on the day two, later in the day, she became extremely hypoxic. Her oxygen requirements increased, requiring high flow nasal cannula up to 100% FiO2, and she had to be transferred to the medical ICU. Uh, then in the medical ICU, bedside echo was done, and it showed that her RV was dilated with RV hypokinesis and McConnell sign, which is the D-shaped septum uh, sign, which is positive for uh, like right heart strain. And interestingly, uh, when they looked at the IVC, they saw two mobile leukogenic masses, which was suggestive of IVC thrombosis. Uh, then she was, uh, she was electively intubated for CT chest PE and taken for CT chest PE, which showed bilateral segmental and subsegmental pulmonary emboli. Uh, but there were findings, but not definitive of right heart strain. Uh, after this, an ultrasound uh, uh, venous Doppler was done, which showed DVT of proximal right femoral vein and nothing on the left side. Because she had the IVC thrombus, we had to see the extent of the thrombus. So a CT venogram was done, uh, which showed the IVC thrombus extended uh, till the level of renal veins. And also uh, there was DVT involving the proximal right common femoral vein, right common iliac vein. And, I, um, and also there was thrombosis within the left common iliac vein and the left internal iliac vein. Following this, there was like further workup for the hypercoagulable state. So initially when she presented on day two, uh, if you look at this, like her PT, INR, APTT, everything were high 
And at this point, she was not on any anticoagulation. Her fibrin split products were high. Fibrinogen was 210. Uh, there were some uh, concerns for DIC. Peripheral smear was done, but did not show any fragmented cells or schistocytes. Uh, then her D-dimer was also elevated, and these labs were followed on on the day three. Uh, in, very interestingly, her factor levels were elevated, especially factor eight and factor nine. They were elevated to uh, 277 percent and 163 percent, respectively. And I'll be talking about this more in the later slide. Her, uh, going back to her hospital course, so on day two, after all that events, I was consulted whether uh, something could be done, but the clot was small. Uh, uh, in the lungs and was not amenable to any intervention or thrombolysis. And there wasn't much benefit of IVC either. So uh, because the clot burden was still very high, it was decided that we have to start her on modified heparin drip, even though her platelet counts were low. So initially, uh, uh, she was started on modified heparin drip with role APTT between 60 to 90 seconds. But as we know, like in each, uh, even before the heparin, uh, her APTT was high, like 58 seconds. So that was not a good uh, way to measure uh, to make sure that the heparin is therapeutic. So anti 10 levels or UNH levels were used. And along with this, uh, she was given as needed platelet transfusion to give uh, to keep platelet counts above 50,000. Even with this, we were not able to achieve therapeutic APTP goals. And so she was switched to uh, Lovenox at one mic per kg BID thereafter. So here we have this diagnosis of a disseminated virus cell associated with thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. Uh, which was extensive in, uh, with bilateral DVT to the iliacs and the IVC. A further hospital course on day four, uh, like the platelet counts were not recovering. So she was given one dose of IVIG uh, for presumed uh, de uh, disseminated varicella induced ITP. And uh, on day four, there was some concern for CNS involvement with exophoria as there was reaction to light stimulation on the left, but not on the right. So she further underwent uh, various um, uh, neuroimaging. CT head and CT angiogram was negative, did not show any dural uh, venous sinus thrombosis. But the MRI brain was concerning for microhemorrhages, and the differentials would be microemboli versus CNS vasculopathy to her viral infection. Uh, so some more hypercoagulable workup. So on day three, we also checked her anti-cardiolipin IgM and IgG. Uh, and at that time, they were low, like it was 28, it was less than 40. And we can see that this IgM proteins can be, uh, can be cross-reactive and can be high in viral infections. So at that time, we were not considering that this could be something like antiphospholipid syndrome or catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. But then they were repeated again at day six and they went increasingly up to 82. So at day six, because uh, like with her increasing anti cardiolipin IgM and the possibility that two organ systems could be involved, including the CNS, uh, there was a possibility that this could be catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, although it did not meet the strict criteria because it requires uh, involvement of three organ systems. But uh, just weighing the risk benefit ratio, uh, it was decided to uh, do empiric treatment for possible caps and she was started with plasmapheresis for five days and she was extubated on day 10. Uh, following day 11, after completing her five days of plasma phoresis, uh, she started receiving IVIG uh, for CAPS. And uh, usually the treatment for CAPS is also steroids, but in her case, uh, given that she was immunocompromised and uh, steroids were held, uh, and she continued to improve as well. Uh, and after 10 days of completing the IVA cyclovir, she was transitioned to oral acyclovir to complete seven more days. Now, just looking at the course of thrombus cytopenia vis-a-vis uh, -vis the treatments. So initially on day four, uh, IVIG one gram per kilogram was given, uh, uh, but there wasn't much improvement in the platelet count. Then it was decided to uh, do plasma phoresis for five days and then stud steadily uh, the platelet count did improve. And like you can see here, it's almost back to the baseline at 240. And before discharge, uh, she completed the IVIG, her platelet count recovered to baseline 300K. And she was discharged home on warfarin, uh, warfarin because there was a still suspicion of antiphospholipid syndrome. And she was also discharged to come on oral acyclovir to complete that. So now moving on to our objectives of a further talk. So we, uh, I'll be talking about clinical manifestations of disseminated varicella 
possible mechanisms of varicella associated thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. And then Dr. Quiris will take over and will tell us about approach to thrombocytopenia in an inpatient setting and antiphospholipid syndrome and CAPS. So uh, as we know that varicella zoster virus, it's a double-stranded DNA virus of the herpes viridae family. It affects only humans and the primary route of spread is via the respiratory tract. Incubation period from contact to appearance of rash is around 10 to 20 days. So the diagnosis is primarily on the clinical findings, like they're very less vesicular rash. Uh, and for like, if they're infected, so mainly they're like herpes simplex, uh, herpes zoster and then varicella zoster. And uh, there could be some autoimmune diseases like pemphigus, uh, which can have a vesicular rash. And the other definitive diagnosis is VZV culture, uh, which is negative, like viral cultures were negative in her case. And the T-Zang smear, uh, in her case, the T-Zang smear was negative probably because we didn't have a vesicular lesion at that time. And then uh, in her, uh, uh, the biopsy for DFA is positive, uh, is uh, diagnostic. And in our patient, that was diagnostic. Now, just looking at some of the uh, clinical manifestations of uh, varicella, of disseminated varicella, it can cause encephalitis, optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, several uh, venous thrombosis, and stroke. It can affect our heart and lungs, causing myocarditis, pericarditis, uh, pneumonitis, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, and pulmonary artery hypertension. It can affect our liver and pancreas, causing hepatitis and pancreatitis. Uh, can affect kidneys with uh, glomerulonephritis. Can affect, uh, can cause sepsis, can cause orchitis, osteomyelitis, and as in our patient, it caused thrombocytopenia and extensive thrombosis. There's another entity, purpura fulminans, which is seen in patients with varicella, which is basically microthrombosis in association with uh, DVT, where we see that uh, peripherally there's like gangrene of the involved area, and it can cause, uh, it can lead to skin and soft tissue infection as well. So what are the sum of the possible mechanisms of varicella associated thrombocytopenia? These have been reported like back in 1980s. Uh, like it can affect various steps. It can affect platelet production. So it can inhibit platelet production. It can cause immune mediated platelet destruction. It can uh, like cause coagulopathy state and like DIC and it can have direct platelet viral interactions as well. Uh, looking at some of the possible mechanisms of thrombosis. Uh, it can cause vasculitis, uh, direct endothelial damage. There's a possibility that there can be acquired protein S deficiency, uh, secondary to increase in uh, C4B complement. And uh, like there can be transient increase in antiphospholipid and coagulation protein antibodies, which we thought that probably uh, kind of played a role in our patients. And this is very transient. It, uh, they come back to normal uh, after uh, the viral prodrome has uh, finished. Uh, now look, looking at some of the reported cases from the literature uh, for hypercoagulability following varicella infection. Uh, so these cases are mostly from the Eastern side of the world from developing countries uh, seen in adults. Uh, it can uh, like cause cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, DVT, uh, pulmonary embolism. And many cases have been also reported in children because this, this, this disease is more common in children as seen in adults. Uh, now, a small thing about the factor eight and factor nine. So it's been seen that factor eight elevation uh, per se in itself, like above, uh, it increases the risk of thrombosis. Like if it's more than 150%, it increases the risk of thrombosis by fivefold. And a factor nine activity, if it's uh, more, it increases the thrombosis by two to threefold. And in our patient, her factor eight levels were 277%, while factor nine was 163. But now with COVID, this is, I think, a very common scenario. Dr. Fides was telling me we have seen as high as uh, more than 400%. So there's something to think about over here that the viral, probably these viral uh, infections lead to a state of inflammation, and this uh, leads to prothrombosis. Um, and this increases the risk of first VTE and as well as recurrent uh, viral thrombosis. Uh, now, this is a cross-sectional study uh, uh, which was done in 2000 uh, to look at like whether these anti autoantibodies to phospholipid and coagulation proteins are they elevated in uh, children which were infected with VZV compared to children who were not. And they found that lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, 
antibody, antiphospholipid antibodies, and the other autoantibodies were all elevated and uh, they were significantly elevated. Although there isn't any direct correlation, but this is something to keep in mind because we don't see them uh, to be elevated in a normal person. Um, so over here, I conclude my presentation. I would like to thank my program, uh, my program director and my chief presidents to give me this opportunity and Dr. Tweed especially to do this with me. Thank you for your support and guidance. And I would uh, like to thank our beloved patient who gave me and all of us a chance to learn so much from her. Uh, thank you so much. And here I hand over to Dr. Tweedis. Thank you very much, Ankita. That's a great start. And I'm now going to uh, follow through on some uh, very uh, instructive uh, parts of the case. Um, I just want to first emphasize of uh, the titles I have here. The one I'm most proud of is uh, R34. And uh, that's because uh, it kind of is a reminder that I still enjoy what I do uh, now in my 34th year of residency. And uh, I did share that uh, joy and uh, excitement actually with this case. Uh, I belong to a group of us are on what we call Heme Twitter. And uh, that weekend uh, I shot a, um, you know, a, uh, a, a tweet that uh, I came across this case uh, as well as we had several others that week that was very interesting actually in the ICU. So uh, it was, uh, you know, quite, uh, uh, you know, interesting and uh, quite satisfying, particularly, you know, as we could, uh, you know, hopefully make a difference. The problem, of course, is that uh, unlike that picture, I am, uh, you know, uh, turning gray, uh, probably in part with many of these challenging cases, you can imagine this case here. But uh, I also uh, show this tweet because of the fact that um, uh, this uh, joy of hematology is shared by many of our residents, including Ankita, who is a uh, future hematology uh, attendee. And uh, she came across this tweet, I guess she follows me. And uh, she immediately contacted me, wanted to know if uh, she could present or write up this uh, case. So that gives you some background how we ended up with uh, today's speakers for the uh, m, m And then the greatest way I have in uh, you know, uh, coming across these cases and trying to figure them out and make a difference is when uh, I get feedback from the patient. And this is just amazing. Uh, this is uh, just three weeks. This is three weeks from discharge. Three weeks from discharge from the ICU after having been intubated, after having you know, uh, uh, been uh, on the ventilator with confusion, there was a concern that there was varicella encephalopathy. Um, this really puts us all to shame. First of all, the patient looks much better than all of us uh, who are on this panel. Uh, secondly, um, uh, who gets their Christmas card out before Thanksgiving? That's amazing. So uh, I just uh, uh, just want to follow there. And uh, as I finish, we'll I have time for uh, the patient uh, to share her perspective, which I know we're going to uh, learn a lot. So for the general audience, um, and I do thank Ankita for uh, delving into some of the weeds of the uh, actual mechanism, but for the general audience as a take home uh, for today, I did want to cover uh, you know, these two uh, clinical presentations. And uh, certainly one way to tackle uh, any you know, clinical problem is to have uh, separate differentials. So if we think about just a differential about thrombocytopenia and not necessarily tying it in, um, I usually like to have the residents and the fellows think about uh, the mechanisms. Just like anemia, we have uh, the mechanisms of decreased production and increased destruction, but we also have a third mechanism of, uh, of uh, increased uh, consumption. And then we kind of pigeonhole our, our very long differential. There's about 25 different uh, causes here. And we pigeonhole them in terms of three questions I want you to ask. Is it just the platelets that are low or is the crit and the white count lows or pants at medium? Uh, is the uh, timing sudden? Uh, and how severe is the thrombocytopenia? And then again, if we think about these mechanisms, we can then uh, break it down further in terms of whether the plates are low so you can shut down platelet production acutely from alcohol, for example. Or you could have increased consumption uh, that can be obviously from DIC, but it could also be consumed by the spleen. For reasons we don't understand, the uh, spleen uh, will uh, uh, often first lower the platelet count before the white cell count and uh, the red cells go down. And perhaps that's because uh, the liver is also producing thrombopoietin uh, in that uh, sense. 
And then finally, uh, by exclusion, we're ending up with ITP, which classically is acute, isolated, and severe by pattern recognition. Those three asks I want you to make, that really uh, rings bells. So a young lady in the emergency room with blood blisters with very heavy periods and a platelet count of 2,000 and all the other counts are normal, and it's of sudden onset, that's ITP. And ITP is either going to be uh, a situation where we don't know the cause, though I'm not that idiopathic, because I'm not that idiotic, because I do know that it is uh, immune mediated. And then there's secondary immune mediated causes. If we think about this, uh, uh, so, um, so that's uh, essentially how we would first approach a thrombocytopenia. As far as the thrombosis, we want to remember our friend Verkow, and uh, he described, as you know, the three main uh, causes. Uh, so if we go back to our case, uh, back to the thrombocytopenia, uh, her platelets went as low as 20,000. It was primarily low platelets. It was uh, quite severe. And uh, our job was to figure out, was this idiopathic or was it triggered? So remember, the eye is not only idiopathic, but it's immune mediated. So there's many causes. Actually, I'll quickly do a shout out for our institution. Our uh, former uh, uh, chief of hematology decades ago, uh, Dr. Breckenridge came from uh, Case Western, where he published a series of graves being associated with uh, ITP. And uh, then these are the tests that you're going to think about ordering if you suspect. I'm not saying you need to order all these tests. You're only going to do it if it's uh, uh, suggestive of one of these uh, formae frus or secondary causes in that sense. I'm not saying that you should order HIV, monospot, CMV, all those tests but as indicated, order the appropriate test. And again, going back to these uh, three asks about whether it's isolated, acute or chronic or uh, severe, um, we can, in this case, think about whether it's chronic or acute. Obviously, in this case, it was acute onset. This person was previously healthy. So this is, again, by pattern recognition, what we're thinking about. And then we can narrow it down to the fact that the person was in the ICU. And in the ICU, we kind of have a short list, and uh, it kind of is a reminder that we don't want to miss the major uh, conditions that do require intervention, lest the patient could expire. Obviously, if we don't intervene with HIT and stop the heparin and use an antithrombin, the patient could succumb to uh, uh, life-threatening thrombosis. If we don't recognize TTP, there's an 85% chance they could expire from that. And uh, catastrophic antiphospholipid body syndrome is also uh, potentially uh, life-threatening in that regard. Just I want to emphasize on the left here about medications. Uh, Vanco, Zosin, uh, Zyvox are the big ones that we typically see more so uh, than the beta-lactams. So again, if we can summarize our case, uh, you know, essentially we're, we're, uh, this had the flavor that this was uh, ITP-like, certainly well-described in the pediatric population with varicella as Dr. Uh, Kapoor uh, had mentioned. Now, at the same time, we're also thinking about the differential thrombosis. And uh, again, we're thinking about Burkow's uh, triad. And here I'm fleshing out for you a little bit more uh, the, you know, uh, the possibilities. It was mentioned that uh, the patient's uh, father had a, had a uh, venothromboembolism. So one does wonder if perhaps there is uh, associated um, uh, uh, underlying thrombophilia, perhaps factor V light and or prothrombin gene mutation would be the most common. As you know, they're incredibly uh, common in that uh, sense. And then acquired causes is certainly, you know, what we see the most. My dear house staff are always interested to order, order, order for AT3CS, factor V and prothrombin. And they kind of forget taking a good history about uh, the acquired causes. And I cannot emphasize uh, any more about cancer. So that's why it's listed there, uh, ad infinitum for you. Cancer-associated thrombosis occurs uh, sometime in the course of one's uh, uh, disease with cancer uh, and up to a third or even higher. And as hematologists, there are some specific entities that we can also see associated with thrombosis. Our sickle patients have a 10% risk in that regard. And uh, there's now uh, very good data that inflammatory bowel disease may be as high as 10%. But again, uh, this is a little bit misleading to, to kind of split these categories because it all overlaps. The best model of thrombosis is that it's multifactorial. In other words, not just say you have inflammatory bowel disease, but perhaps you have a flare with inflammation and you're in the hospital and you're immobile and, uh, um, you know, in, in that uh, sense. So multiple causes uh, in that regard. And then there's some new medications I want to bring to your attention besides 
uh, lenalidomide and pomalidomide we use for myeloma, but a drug we use for uh, breast cancer and a drug for inflammatory bowel disease. And then obviously stasis, uh, we forget often uh, to uh, really, uh, pardon the pun, put a lot of weight on the BMI. That is a big uh, factor. And then vessel injury, we often forget about uh, smoking. And again, this can all overlap. This doesn't do it justice in the sense that often, uh, you know, that's more than one cause. So it's like the perfect storm uh, that the patient has. So if we summarize in our patient's uh, case, uh, we did find several reports about varicella. Again, more common in the pediatric population, but uh, is that one series of three adult patients, it has been reported. And uh, we know nowadays with the COVID-19 story that we clearly uh, can see thrombosis, particularly again, as we think about multiple causes in the ICU immobilized. And then uh, there's some question whether there was APS. So now if we put our case together, uh, we have uh, thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. And the real uh, issue, uh, are they true and unrelated or true and related? Ideally, we would like to have one unifying diagnosis. I think all of us try to do that every day. And we really uh, end up with one unifying diagnosis. So that's why the title said finally a case of Occam's razor. And even though Lord, uh, uh, even though William of Occam, who was a monk, uh, the, his name is spelled uh, of the city O-C-H-A-M, and the literature it's referred to as O-C-C-A-M, Occam's razor. So having one uh, diagnosis to explain all. And uh, these are two uh, uh, that uh, clearly uh, can have both thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, particularly number one is what you're going to encounter the most. But certainly going back to cancer, 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 we can see that in that sense. We uh, did not have clear-cut evidence for DIC nor an underlying malignancy, but we started to think about other causes. And uh, one of that does include the possibility of uh, antiphosphate antibody syndrome and uh, immune-related uh, thrombocytopenia, ITP. And about a third, we do see, uh, we see this. And then nowadays, uh, as you know, in the ICU, uh, we have a relatively high prevalence of COVID-19 related uh, clotting. And uh, to a certain degree, these patients, uh, not to a great degree, but they can have also immune mediated thrombocytopenia. And uh, so that's a very common scenario. And what I'm gonna say in our case, uh, what we ended up is now with COVID-19, we ended up with these two causes uh, here. And uh, so that's, uh, um, you know, that was our working diagnosis, uh, though this evolved over the course of a week. Again, that's a reminder. Sometimes uh, we don't immediately, uh, you know, make a diagnosis until all the data kind of evolves over time. For example, the uh, antiphosphate antibody uh, titer returning uh, elevated at 82. And uh, that is one criterion that you have to have an elevated uh, level, ideally above 40. We do think the IgG anticarylipin is more pathogenic. Um, and some experts are not even sure you need the beta glycoprotein, but the criteria for laboratory criteria is you need one of the three, but most importantly, it has to be two or more occasions. So they, uh, we shouldn't be writing in the chart that somebody has APAS uh, comma definite if you don't have the, the privilege of time to repeat in 12 weeks. So in this patient's case with an elevated anticarylipin, we would just say it's probable but we would still have to consider and treat it in that vein uh, because otherwise the consequences could be catastrophic. Again, part of the fun. Uh, and so that's the laboratory criteria. And obviously the clinical criteria is uh, thrombotic events, as you can see outlined in this uh, uh, figure here. This also can include adrenal infarct, cerebral involvement. Um, the patient did not have obviously a stroke, but uh, there was some question whether there was uh, uh, perhaps thrombotic or hemorrhagic involvement, it wasn't uh, clear. Maybe it was just related to vasculitis, related uh, to varicella. Uh, but we didn't, and then obviously there was, uh, you know, pulmonary embolus and uh, bilateral uh, DVT. Uh, but again, the important thing is that we have to have uh, at least two more, uh, at least uh, two occasions, 12 weeks apart, um, a uh, positive uh, test. And if all three are positive, uh, we call that uh, a triple positive. And those are the people I'll allude to uh, really shouldn't be managed with a direct oral anticoagulant. And then again, just as a review, uh, the triad of APAS is, uh, you know, uh, these three here. And usually the events kind of occur on the same side, so to speak. And the thrombocytopenia is not that uncommon. I mentioned earlier 30%, so in that range. 
when uh, we do see, as in this case, someone who is infected and they have an elevated antiphospholipid antibody, as Ankita implied, there is an association. Uh, usually it's with IgM, as in this case, and usually it's not associated with thrombosis. So perhaps the patient had a second cause or a double hit, perhaps a familial thrombophilia given her father's history of uh, thrombosis in that regard. And uh, usually uh, um, it's more isolated to the IgM, and uh, that's true in our case. This patient did not have an elevated anti-beta glycoprotein antibody. There's a whole myriad of bacterial infections can uh, be associated with uh, an elevated IgM antiphospholipid. Uh, Dr. Sham uh, recalls years ago, uh, it was often with HIV um, as far as viral infections. Um, and also varicella is definitely on the list. And uh, uh, just the complete parasitic infections uh, can often uh, you know, be associated. So at this point, we had a, a, a IgM anticarolipin that returned at 82. Um, the patient ultimately was managed with Lovenox initially. Uh, even though the lupus anticoagulant screen was negative, there were some issues with an elevated PPT to a certain degree, and uh, it was hard to, uh, act to uh, really follow that. So we used Lovenox initially, and then the question is, once the patient stabilized, uh, do we do, uh, do anticoagulation with a DOAC? Yes or no. And nowadays, the party line is don't uh, use a direct role anticoagulant. It's now becoming one of the rare exceptions because in general, it's a preferred agent over warfarin for someone with DTE or for stroke prevention. But uh, if they have a high risk uh, triple positive, um, uh, there's now several studies, including this study from Italy. Uh, there was a multi-center study in Italy that was halted early uh, because there's a high rate of breakthrough events. It's a little bit confusing study. It's not a large study. There were 54 patients in each arm. And uh, the majority had VTE, but uh, what's unusual is that the breakthrough events were mostly arterial. And we often don't see someone who has a VTE then have a breakthrough arterial event. Uh, but it's still concerning. It was a randomized study. And then the uh, Spanish group came up with another study where they looked also, they included people who just had perhaps thrombosis with an isolated lupus anticoagulant. And they also showed uh, that uh, um, there was uh, inferiority with uh, uh, river raxaban. So until there's more data and until we can do studies looking just as single or double positives, um, we shouldn't use direct role anticoagulant. I know again, the house staff is fond of doing full thrombophilia testing when someone comes in with a blood clot. As we mentioned, there's reasons not to do that. Um, the, the, you know, the clot can consume factors like protein C and S, and it's really not, not going to change your management in general, except for some exceptions like perhaps severe protein S where you may, or C where you may get replacement. But the one uh, uh, ask we have for the house staff is when you admit somebody who has a uh, unprovoked clot, in other words, idiopathic, uh, please at least before you start a DOAC, get a lupus anticoagulant and anticarolipin and beta like proteins because if they're all positive, uh, the patient should uh, be on Lovenox to uh, warfarin. So please remember that. Uh, before I give some time to the patient, um, uh, for her perspective, uh, uh, at one point uh, with an elevated uh, anticarolipin of 85, we were concerned about this entity. We could say that there was perhaps thrombosis in the brain, there wasn't elsewhere, so it wasn't uh, typically, this wasn't definite uh, catastrophic, but maybe possible. And um, the management is uh, really throwing in the kitchen sink, uh, which essentially uh, would include these three. And uh, if that fails, there's uh, emerging data. I've used that two occasions with Tuxumab. And the reason to use Ecluzumab is this very intriguing study by my colleague Shruti Shurtavedi at Johns Hopkins. She's a former fellow. Uh, that I've worked with, and uh, she showed that uh, people with uh, CAPS uh, have a high proportion of uh, complement uh, gene uh, 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 abnormalities. So lastly, just to summarize as we turn this over to our wonderful patient, uh, is that uh, initially uh, we were on a um, you know tight uh, rope here with uh, trying to anticoagulate her. Filter wouldn't help because there was clot in the IVC above the renal veins. And um, so uh, we had to use both uh, platelets, IVIG to keep her platelet count up. And then uh, as the anticarolipin returned at 82, 
uh, we, uh, um, you know, began plasma exchange. This is the collective we, because uh, I was on at the beginning, uh, and then uh, Dr. Single and Dr. David, uh, my uh, wonderful partner, uh, was on over the weekend, and Dr. David pulled the trigger to do plasma exchange. Uh, then our fellow Dr. Kasnath with uh, my other wonderful colleague, Dr. Ree, uh, uh, then uh, followed through by uh, treating this presumptively as possible uh, caps with IVIG again for five days uh, after plasma exchange uh, for five days. And just as an aside, uh, I have these wonderful colleagues. It's going to make it easy to retire, I guess. But again, with these very uh, rewarding cases, it's uh, uh, hard not to keep uh, doing what you uh, love in uh, that regard. So finally, uh, on repeat testing three months later, her anticarlipin IgM is now down to four. So in my humble opinion, this is not really APAS. It was probably a viral uh, transient uh, APAS. Uh, and because uh, the patient is, you know, taking care of a family and, uh, and uh, doing meal management and having, you know, it's the challenges of watching her, keeping her vitamin K, um, you know, intake uh, stable, we've actually decided to switch to Eliquis. And then we'll follow up with a repeat ultrasound. And these are the options uh, Jan and I discussed last week of what to do. And she does have a daughter and uh, uh, knowledge of whether there could be factor fiber or prothrombin is helpful at the time of beginning uh, COC and uh, pregnancy postpartum. So uh, that's where we are. I'm going to end there. And uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, our patient. And um, uh, if she could uh, begin with, um, you know, some uh, comments, perspective uh, to help make us better doctors and <laughs> caregivers. Thank you. And thank you, Janet, uh, for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, boy, did I learn a lot from, from listening to all that. And I just want to say that I received exceptional care. And I thank everyone that was involved um, with my care. Um, the support that my family received while I was in the hospital certainly helped in my healing process. Um, and, you know, just to to point out that I had no idea, obviously, how sick I was. And when I went into the emergency department, I thought it was just a rash with some back pain. I didn't feel great. And I do apologize for those that were in the ED and I was quite loud is what I remember <laughs> because of the pain. But um, from that point on, I felt well taken care of. Um, and honestly, I don't remember a whole lot after I was admitted to the floor, um, except there was a conversation with one of the physicians uh, about how sick I was. Um, and from there, when I woke up, I thought it was just one day later. Um, so, and even after I was extubated, you know, I felt informed and uh, very well supported. So thank you for all that. My pain was well managed. Um, and even now that I'm home, uh, the care that I continue to receive has been exceptional. So thank you to everyone who was involved um, for saving me. <laughs> so thank you. The one question that does come up is about um, uh, if you uh, recall having chicken pox and you don't, right? Possibly it's somewhat apocryphal in your family, correct? Yeah, maybe a very, very mild case of it when I was younger, but other than that, no. So the audience is thinking just like you, uh, Janet, uh, one of the questions is whether you should be immunized for uh, uh, chicken pox, and then mm -hmm. obviously the COVID-19. Uh, uh, so as you know, we uh, talked to Dr. Walsh, who was also uh, you know, involved in your care from uh, infectious disease. And what we'll do is in April, as you know, we're going to draw your blood to see what your level of your chicken pox, you know, uh, antibodies are, and then we'll decide uh, accordingly. And mm -hmm. um, again, uh, as you know, uh, it's not clear that there's a definite, you know, a dangerous signal with the COVID-19, but we'll, as we decided, we'll wait. Uh, you'll be going back to school, hopefully in person in the fall. So we have some yeah. time for some more data. and. Uh, you know, go ahead with that. Yeah, thank you. 
And then there's some questions we had on that list of the causes of other viruses like mono um, and HIV. We did test for those. That, we did test for HIV. That was negative. Uh, was one of the questions someone had that they that this is an association that's true. And um, also someone asked about whether the factor eight can cause clots in the arteries. It's more in the venous side, but um, uh, anyway, um, uh, we really appreciate your time. Is there any other advice you give to the, the staff for being better <laughs> caregivers, hopefully? You know, I really can't give any other advice. I felt very well taken care of, so thank you. All right, thank you, and thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.